Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Growing Concerns webinar for July 31st. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. So with that, I will turn it over to Lionel Caskey. Thanks, Karma. Um, I'd like to thank Karma for uh, helping out. Linda's on holiday, so uh, Karma is going to be uh, taking her place today. So, uh, and anyways, uh, welcome everybody to Growing Concerns for uh, July 31st. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few things today. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a crops update. Um, going to talk a little bit of an update on on the hail damage or the hail situation we've seen throughout the southwest here over the past. Probably the last uh, couple of weeks, where we've had uh, different different events that have uh, given some hail damage, and just talk a little bit about what we're seeing after, and uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the diseases that are showing up, and a little. I guess uh, I got fusarium on the agenda because it's definitely showing up, so I want to talk a little bit about that, and then uh, uh, do a little bit of talk about some insects. Uh, and some insect update issues that are going on in the, in the area as well. They're probably not all going to be in the exact order that I've got them there, but uh, we're going to uh, go through all these anyways. So first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the hail issues and, and what I've been seeing and what the producers have been seeing in the fields and then as well as uh, how a lot of the, the, uh, the uh, I guess the claims are going to be are looking at being handled right now because the hail happened in, in kind of a, an early time period when a lot of the crop was just starting to, was a lot of the canola crop was flowering and a lot of the uh, soybeans and sunflowers were still not, uh, not, some of the soybeans I guess were flowered or just starting to flower but most of the sunflowers weren't, weren't doing much yet. A lot of the uh, uh, claims have been deferred and uh, there's going to be a lot of work done later on as to determining the extent of the damage, and most of the claims right now were on defoliation, so there would be, uh, you know, basically just a percentage of, of leaf material lost, and there would be a factor paid according to that. What we are seeing in a lot of the fields is we're seeing a lot of regrowth now, and uh, you're, you know, when you look at this, uh, the picture I've got out there right now, you can see the canola is actually starting to reflower in a lot of places. And a lot of the fields that were, uh, when you look in look areas where that didn't get hit, uh, pods are developing and uh, and forming a nice seed already. And meanwhile, some of the the rest of the fields are starting to go into flower and produce new seed again or new pods again. So we're going to have some issues with uh, with the canola crop regarding uh, uh, the maturity and and just just the the right stage to be going out there and assessing uh, when we should be, be cutting, but that's some, something that we'll be dealing with in, in future uh, uh, webinars, but uh, we definitely are seeing the, uh, the canola regrowing right now. <clears throat> one plant or one crop that's maybe not doing as well or not really rebounding as well as some of the pea crops uh, that got hailed. Uh, we're seeing more and more damage show up. Uh, our, the extent of the damage starting to show up a lot more in, in, in these plants and and you can see wherever the pods got hit and if the if, and a lot of the peak crop was potted at that time. So wherever the pods got hit, a lot of those are breaking open right now. And when you open up some of those pods, a lot of the seed is is brown or are actually not even forming a, a seed anymore. It's almost rotting off already. So we're definitely seeing some issues in the pea crops where they're probably not going to come back as, as good. Um, with the soybean crops, I did get a picture of them this week, but uh, with the soybeans, uh, they're, uh, they're coming back. Uh, they're coming back slower uh, than the canola crop is, and probably because the soybeans could use some warmer, warmer growing conditions, and we just haven't been getting that. We've been getting cool, uh, cool conditions, wet conditions. And uh, right now they need uh, they need some heat, and um, so we are seeing regrowth, but is it's slow. Uh, with the sunflowers, uh, again, it's one of those crops that, depending on how hard it was hit, uh, if it was able to withstand the the, the hit of the hail, then uh, then it's still growing. If it was broken off, a lot of those are rotting. So 
the big thing with a lot of these crops is going to be the uh, disease issues that are going to come up later on in the growing season. So that will be something that we'll be talking as well uh, in future, uh, future webinars. So leaving uh, the hail situation and, uh, and going over to uh, the uh, uh, slide that we show every, every week uh, regarding the, uh, what we've seen, I guess, in rainfall and, and uh, growing degree days over the last uh, eight days. Uh, when you look at uh, the chart here, you can definitely see that uh, our, our growing degree days, <coughs> we're pretty much right on average right now. Um, I got a feeling we might be falling behind a bit in some areas, and uh, and if uh, when the next report comes out, we'll probably see uh, some of these numbers drop a little bit as well because we're just not getting uh, getting the heat uh, right now that uh, we normally would be getting in July and the first part of August. So I could see some of these numbers dropping off for for next week's webinar. When you look over at our rainfall amounts, we're we're definitely above average in most areas, and uh, you know basically. Uh, We've been seeing that because it's been raining pretty much every second to third day, it seems like, in, in, uh, in most areas throughout the southwest. So um, needing some warm weather and needing some weather with, uh, with, uh, with no rain showers in it would uh, definitely help some of the crops, especially some of the, the higher growing degree day crops uh, like corn and soybeans. And when you travel the country, you definitely see, uh, see a lot of those crops uh, in, uh, in the ground this year and uh, definitely a changing landscape in the southwest here when you, uh, when you start to ring around. This is uh, the uh, winter wheat crop that we've been following in the Shoal Lake area and uh, when we uh, started off the year we were having a lot of producers writing off winter wheat and this crop was one of those ones that was borderline and it's, uh, as it's been going throughout the year it's definitely, uh, definitely been one of the a good thing that the producer kept this crop because it's definitely filled in and compensated for uh, some of the winter kill issues and uh, this is what the field looks like as of yesterday so it's starting to get a turn to it. Um, had enough straw strength that uh, didn't go down with uh, any lodging issues with uh, some of the rains and winds we've been having so uh, it's uh, looking to be a, a, fairly, uh, a fairly decent crop and again here's just the other angle from, from that same site and you can definitely see a, a turning of the field. It'll be interesting to see um, uh, the fusarium levels in the field and uh, I'm hoping that uh, Calmer will probably have some slides for us uh, uh, or some pictures for us next week uh, regarding, the, uh, regarding the fusarium and some of the, these winter wheat fields and, and especially the ones that uh, like this one that, that have come on fairly well but uh, we'll get a definitely a, a wide range of, uh, of uh, of maturity in the field, so it'll be interesting to see how, how high the levels are. So leaving that slide, uh, we're going to go to a little bit of a, a crop update uh, for for the area. And uh, like I mentioned already, we've definitely had some wet, humid conditions with uh, really heavy morning dews over the last uh, week and a half to two weeks here. Uh, most of the producers that we're going to spray fungicides on the crops have already done it and because most of the crops are past the point already where fungicide application would be uh, a, a much of a benefit. So uh, like I mentioned the fungicide applications are done. Um, we're seeing a lot of crop lodging over the last, uh, last week with the rains and the winds so we're going to see some issues showing up with that. Um, with the uh, humidity and the wet conditions, fusarium is something that we're uh, starting to see show up in a lot of the fields and I'll be talking a little bit about that later. Cooler temperatures uh, have been really good for the canola crop though. The canola crop has flowered for a long time period this year. So uh, fields that have, uh, haven't uh, experienced any weather events that have set them back, these fields are uh, flowering for three weeks, uh, three weeks plus. And uh, you know, so we definitely have uh, have uh, uh, potential for some decent yield on some of the crops. Uh, there uh, is some concern in the area now because disease is starting to show up in canola as well. And I'll be talking a bit about those uh, those issues a little bit later. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the concerns with the hail damage or the hail we've had, we've had some injury to some of the plants, and it's a it's a great. Uh, um, I guess avenue for black lake to uh, to show up and get established in in the crops and and not even if you had just a 
uh, a hailstorm go through, but even some of the high winds that have gone through have damaged some of the some of the crop, and with that they leave uh, open lesions, and that's basically a, a great area for blackleg to show up. So I'd imagine over the next you know week to ten days we'll be able to identify blackleg and the crops fairly easily. Just a couple of slides or pictures here of some of the lodging that is happening happening in the southwest here, and you can see. A, this field here is uh, south of Hamiota area where uh, it's gone down. I think this is the third time already that it's gone down. So the likelihood of this coming back up to any extent is probably going to be uh, be minimal. But uh, you know uh, the crop still seems to be uh, filling not too bad. So the the heads are developing okay. Uh, we're definitely going to see some yield loss though because some of it is uh, lying flat on the ground. So we're definitely seeing some lodging issues. This is another one uh, after the um, last rainstorm in the Newdale area. Elmer was up in that area, and he got some pictures of some of the lodging as well. And uh, and uh, Elmer's been noticing that uh, uh, you know uh, even some lodging to the point where it's uh, some varieties are lodging a lot easier than others. Uh, so we're trying to do uh, put a few things together there to see if one variety is maybe showing just a little bit more potential for lodging than others, but. Uh, so we hopefully have more information on that as we, we go through the webinar series uh, this fall. Field peas, uh, most of the field peas are out of flower now. Uh, we're getting some lodging in the peas, but not bad. Uh, you know, uh, we got a, a lot of growth. Uh, the peas are, uh, are fairly high. Uh, they've got heavy pod development, so uh, the potential for some good yields on the peas is, uh, is there. Uh, the microsporella issue, uh, which would uh, you know cause the premature ripening of peas, hasn't been a, a major factor as of yet. So that's uh, that's great for uh, pea growers because uh, we're not seeing too many issues there yet. Uh, flax fields, uh, you know, the flax uh, usually one of the crops that's sown a little bit later, and usually flowers during the heat of the summer, which would be the end of July and beginning of August. So usually we we feel we lose yield because of that, but the uh, weather we've been having over the last, you know, week to 10 days has definitely favored uh, the flax, and you can definitely see that it's uh, it's light in the weather, and it's uh, it's uh, it's flowering really nice right now, and um, some of the earliest fields are almost done flowering, so, uh, you know, uh, we, there's uh, potential for the flax crop, and uh, I think most producers have uh, applied a fungicide for, uh, for uh, PASMO control. Uh, so uh, we should uh, hopefully be, uh, you know, if things go good, the flax crop should be, uh, uh, be coming on not too bad right now. Regarding flax and canola, one of the things that I haven't seen, and I haven't put a slide together on it today, but it just uh, we haven't seen a whole bunch of aster yellow as of, as of yet uh, throughout the southwest. And uh, so that's a good sign. Last year we had uh, levels that were approaching, you know, between 5 and 10% and in some fields. So, uh, we haven't been seeing any of that showing up so far, so that's uh, that's definitely a good sign. The corn and soybean crops, um, like mentioned a little bit earlier, because of the cooler temperatures, are developing slower, but uh, nonetheless are are moving forward. And uh, you know, the mo majority of the soybeans are flowering, uh, and uh, some of the early seeded uh, corn crops are tasseling right now, and uh, and we're getting some uh, some cop uh, starting to develop on on the on the stalks as well. Uh, sunflowers, uh, most of the sunflowers are just in the bud stage, so we'll be probably starting to see flowers you know, within the next week or so. And some of the early fields in some of the drier areas are starting to flower now, but uh, again, uh, we're, uh, we're, not, uh, we're, we're falling a little bit behind on, on these crops as to where we would expect them to be at this time. Just a couple pictures of some of the pea fields. I took this picture uh, yesterday and uh, you know, you definitely can see with the uh, with the pod development and uh, and with the stand. Uh, you know, there's definitely uh, potential for some pretty good yield there. Most of those pods were anywhere from, you know, four to to five uh, seeds per pod, which is uh, which is a pretty good average to have, especially when you have that many pods showing up. Just a picture of some of the corn I was testing that I was uh, in some of the fields yesterday, and then some of the the cob development starting. With that, I'm going to kind of leave the crop update. Uh, um, crop update is uh, 
something we like to do every week, and uh, Elmer uh, has uh, been helping quite a bit with it because he uh, does the, the crop report for the Southwest, so a lot of the information he's got in there is, is good, and that's also on our MAPRI website. Regarding the insects now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about grasshoppers. It seems that we've been getting uh, quite a few calls over the last week regarding grasshoppers, and John Gavoski put together a few uh, questions regarding you know what, uh, what he's been hearing from producers, and pretty much we've all been getting kind of the very similar questions, you know, as, as to uh, the crop starting to mature and the grasshopper starting to get a little bit bigger. Uh, uh, it seems like uh, when producers first walk out into the field, you see a, a whole bunch of grasshoppers because that's kind of where they would have uh, started from as smaller grasshoppers in the ditches and ditch areas and then be moving into the field. So it always looks bad when you first walk into the field, but as you get farther out into the field, I'm finding that the levels aren't aren't high or aren't that bad right now. But just to go through a few of the questions that uh, John put together and, uh, you know, one of the major ones, I guess, that everybody asks is will they be feeding on the heads, whether it be on the wheat heads, barley heads, uh, your flax, um, cutting the, tipping the balls off or, or, uh, or even fit, fill, uh, feeding on the canola pods. And, uh, and they will. Uh, they probably don't prefer them as much as some of the lush grass that's out there or some of the weeds that are lush. But uh, as the season goes on, uh, they will be feed. They will go to uh, areas where they will, uh, that'll be, I guess, more favorable to them. So uh, as the season goes on, that's where they'll start going to. So uh, the biggest thing with that would be to be monitoring. And if you see that the damage is happening, if they're on the lower leaves of your crop and eating the lower leaves of your crop, no, no big damage. But if you start feeding on the heads, that's when you really need to be to be watching and starting to assess if you need to do some control. Um, one other question is, is like I kind of mentioned, grasshoppers are in the field, but they're not doing a whole bunch of damage. And uh, you know, um, John put the you know put together this where you know there are a whole uh, there are a lot of different species of grasshoppers out there, and the one that we're probably most uh, prone to see doing damage would be the two-striped grasshopper, and that's the one that. Uh, is uh, one that we see in, in probably uh, higher amounts in the field. And that's what he looks like right there. And uh, and so, you know, basically, if you're seeing that, uh, that guy out there, he's the one that's probably going to do most of your damage. Regarding grasshoppers, before we leave them, there's also a fungus that uh, affects the grasshoppers. And uh, we're, uh, I haven't seen any of it yet, but uh, John had mentioned that in his report regarding the uh, the fungus that will uh, actually uh, what happens with the grasshopper is it will climb to the top of the plant and cling on to what it would be the head or the or uh, if it's on a weed or whatever every type of plant it's on it seems to move its way up to the top and cling on and that's kind of uh, and it'll it'll die that way on the plant and when you find them out there they uh, when they're they're starting to get really sick what happens is they won't move very much when you go to touch them. They'll just kind of hang there. And uh, then uh, later on when they do die, they're basically full of spores. And when you go to scare them away, uh, if you hit them, they'll just break open and the spores will fall out. And it's kind of like what this guy looks like right here. He just is clinging on to that canola pod, and uh, that's where he died. And uh, if you were to give uh, that a hit, that there, there wouldn't be, uh, there'd be like, a bunch of spores inside the, uh, the body cavity of the, of the grasshopper. Questions regarding grasshoppers and sunflowers. Uh, you know, I've been dealing with sunflowers for quite a few years, and I've never really had any issues with uh, grasshoppers doing a whole bunch of damage to the sunflower head. Sunflowers produce such big leaves that grasshoppers can, you know, they could eat a lot of the leaf, and there's still a lot there that's left. So, uh, you know, there really hasn't been a whole bunch of work done with grasshoppers and sunflowers. And I guess the reason is is that the plant is such a big plant that uh, usually it doesn't do uh, a whole bunch of damage to it. Um, most producers that are growing confections sunflowers uh, uh, are usually spraying for other insects that will uh, damage the uh, the seed head, and those uh, those those uh, insecticides will will get the uh, grasshopper as well. So really, uh, you know, I guess not a big uh, issue in, in my mind in sunflowers. Uh, I would say to be checking your field. Again, you might see some holes in leaves. 
Remember that as the leaf grows, the hole gets bigger as well because some people will go out into the field and they'll see a, a hole in the leaf that's, you know, three inches across and, uh, and think that that's a lot of feeding that's been going on. But if the, the, the hole was made earlier on, and uh, the, the leaf keeps growing, the hole, the hole tends to get bigger as well. So just a reminder on that one as well. But again, I've never really had to recommend anybody spray for grasshoppers and sunflowers. So, uh, you know, the, the spraying later on for some of the other seed head insects is usually, uh, usually probably takes care of any issues anyways. And there's just another picture of the two-stripe grasshopper. And you can see how big a leaf that sunflower leaf is. And, uh, you know, he can do a lot of feeding before he's going to do any major damage. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, soybeans now. And uh, it's a crop that's uh, been, uh, the acres have, uh, have increased uh, greatly in the southwest this year. And I guess uh, what's, uh, with that, uh, we're seeing a lot of, uh, getting a lot of questions because producers aren't quite sure on everything that's going on and, and we're, we're learning as we go. But uh, the crop looks uh, really good right now, uh, especially the crops that uh, haven't been you know, affected by any of the weather events that have been going on. Uh, we're seeing some things showing up right now. The, the crop is definitely uh, vegetative right now. We've got a lot of growth. A lot of it's you know, two and a half feet tall already, maybe even getting closer to three feet tall. Uh, a lot of leaf material, and and it's flowering and and producing uh, producing pods. But uh, the the flowering and the pod production is uh, is fairly slow right now. And uh, like I mentioned earlier on, if we get some heat, it sure would be good for it uh, to get some of those uh, those pod that pod development quickening up a little bit. At this time of year, uh, they're starting to see some. Uh, um, aphids showing up in the Carmen and Starbuck area, and this is something being a lot of new growers in, in the southwest probably aren't looking for or haven't uh, maybe even had the, the time yet to be out there looking for them. So uh, if you're out looking for uh, uh, checking your soybean crop, it would be good to be out uh, while you're out there to look on the undersides of the leaves. Uh, that's where the aphids will be. Uh, they'll uh, be very similar to the aphids that uh, you know, we uh, we see normally, uh, uh, but uh, you know, so it's not like you really need to be able to pick out a certain characteristic of it. Uh, if you see them in quantities like there are in this picture here, you know you've you've got some issues, and uh, you need to be watching uh, watching for them. I was out yesterday and was uh, was looking under uh, some of the leaves as well to see if I could be I could find some of them. One of the things you can find is uh, uh, now this is a picture I got off the internet, but you can see that there's uh, castings of the old uh, aphids as they grow. Their skin is on the bottom of the leaves. Uh, ladybugs are great because they uh, they feed on uh, on the aphids, but uh, this is what I was finding yesterday, and you could see the odd casting. Don't be confused. Uh, some of the, the leaves had some uh, some sand or dirt on the bottom of the bottom of the leaves because of the uh, the weather we conditions we've had lately with uh, the range, you get the splashing and uh, and some of the leaves are definitely showing that. So make sure you're looking for, at the right thing, but uh, we definitely were seeing some uh, some some aphid down, or uh, some aphids uh, on, on the leaves yesterday, but uh, numbers were, were really low. Regarding number wise, uh, be best to uh, to check the your your book for control measures and uh, and just to see what uh, what levels you require. While you're um, out in the field, you'll see some of the bees as well, and the uh, ladybugs and the hoverfly are, are the, uh, uh, I guess, natural predator of the aphids, so they'll be out there feeding on aphids, so these are good to have out there. So uh, just remember not to panic spraying, because if we can get these guys cleaning up uh, cleaning up the, uh, the aphids, then uh, we save ourselves dollars as well as uh, save these insects. Also, there's been some insects showing up in corn in uh, in the in the uh, eastern part of the province. Or some uh, uh, finding some egg masses, I guess, of the European corn borer. And uh, so, uh, I guess that when you're out checking fields, it's probably not a bad idea to start checking, uh, you know, uh, for uh, for them as well. 
Um, a lot of the crops, are, a lot of the varieties producers are growing uh, have some resistance to them. But even yesterday when we were out, we were able to find an egg nass. Hard to get a good picture of it, but uh, definitely looked like an egg nass under the underleaf of, uh, of the corn plants. So uh, corn plants are definitely growing fairly fast right now. Are growing now. Uh, if we got some warmer weather, they would uh, would definitely grow a lot faster. But uh, they uh, they have been still moving along. Uh, and like I said, a lot of it's in the tassel and, uh, and forming cobs. So not a lot of other insects to be really watching for in corn right now. The uh, the crop seems to be off and away. A little bit about uh, canola and some of the things we're seeing in canola right now. Uh, really the birth of armyworm uh, uh, issue in canola. I haven't had a whole bunch of uh, calls or concerns uh, to date. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody actually spraying yet in the southwest here. Uh, we were out looking in fields yesterday and I didn't see or wasn't able to find uh, any um, any birth of armyworm. Uh, a lot of the canola is kind of in this stage right now, just going out of flower and potting, so uh, a good time to keep out, keep checking out there and see what's going on. Uh, again, you know, it's uh, it's something where uh, you can't, you know, you got to be monitoring on a on a you know every three to five days sort of thing, be out there and checking just to see what's going on. But uh, right now, the number levels that I've been seeing have been low. Uh, we were finding some diamondback moth uh, larvae yesterday, and might be a little bit harder to see, but uh, there's a diamondback moth right there. And when you uh, again, when you see him on the on the leaf, uh, usually if you you touch him or move him, he'll drop off and dangle from a thread, and uh, that's how it kind of hides from its predators. But uh, we were seeing, uh, you know, the odd one in the field again, but uh, nothing major. Uh, even uh, when you look through the field, we weren't seeing a lot of uh, feeding on leaves or holes in leaves. So uh, really, a lot of the canola crop is uh, seems right now, anyways, where we're not having a major insect uh, uh, problem. Uh, you know, maybe besides the odd grasshopper issue in some of the odd area, but uh, right now we're at the levels of uh, diamondback and bertha are definitely nothing to be too, too concerned about. Um, with, uh, with kind of going with some of the disease issues that are showing up right now, and I mentioned earlier on that uh, we had uh, some fusarium showing up in uh, in fields, and it seems like most of the fields I'm walking, wheat fields I'm walking into right now, we're seeing fusarium show up. And uh, most of the fields, uh, it's not hard to find, um, and I uh, kind of attribute that to uh, kind of a, a cool uh, cool spring, and then you know uh, uh, a flowering window that was probably wider than uh, than we expected, and and conditions were good for fusarium because of the Humidity and the moisture conditions. So we've had uh, we've had a lot of uh, we've had potential for a fusarium. So definitely seeing uh, fusarium show up um, again, pretty common. You're seeing uh, the the you know basically where uh, in this plant here. If you remember from previous webinars, so then the wheat head flowers. It flowers from the middle and goes up and down as it flowers and so depending on when the fusarium was in uh, was there or present in this plant here uh, the infection occurred from here moving upward and you can see that basically affected the top half of uh, the wheat head you go to this one you know it's kind of the middle the top you know middle third sort of thing so it can be all over the head one other thing that I was seeing out in this wheat field yesterday was some bloom blots showing up, and it was kind of purplish to brown gray, gray lesions uh, on the on the head. And when you look down the stem, it was on the stem as well, and uh, uh, can be sometimes maybe mistaken a bit for fusarium, but uh, really the, the purplish brown uh, um, lesions on the head, especially right in there, you notice that that's pretty common. And a lot of times, what will happen there is we'll get staining of the, the the kernel, and if not in severe cases, it'll actually even cause the kernel to shrivel. So, um, are seeing we're seeing some of that in the field, not a whole bunch. 
I uh, was also seeing uh, wheat stem maggot in the field. Uh, wheat stem maggot will be very, uh, very easy to um, to determine if you grab, uh, if you see a white head, like a totally white head in the field, and you grab that head and give it a tug, and if it pulls out from the first node, usually you'll see feeding at the first node, and that uh, that's uh, that'd be where the uh, wheat stem maggot uh, was feeding and basically caused the plant to uh, cut off nutrients going to the head and cause the plant to die prematurely. So uh, you'll see that uh, yesterday in this field we were also seeing white heads that when you gave them a tug it pulled out right from the soil surface and when that happens uh, when you look, uh, look towards the root systems you usually see some root rot issues on a plant like that. A lot of the fields are fairly moist and they have some lodging issues with them so you know we're definitely going to be seeing some root rot issues as well. There's a close-up of uh, Fusarium, and Elmer sent this one, and you can see the pink mold. Uh, so classic Fusarium symptoms when uh, the, the, the disease progresses, you get the um, development of a pinkish to orange type mold on the head, and uh, we'll be seeing this as, as it progresses in the fields, and, and uh, we get later on into uh, maturity of the crop. Last year we had uh, quite a few uh, issues with uh, sclerotinia in in the southwest here on some uh, some varieties and uh, and uh, looks like sclerotinia is showing up again uh, this year. Uh, this was uh, again taken yesterday and uh, you can see it was uh, it was actually really easy to find in this field and uh, actually it's developed fairly fast. Uh, you can see uh, the lesions have basically taken the whole stem already and uh, in this case caused the one stem to break already. This one's not far from breaking. So uh, I would imagine over the next week to 10 days in some of these canola fields that are going out of bloom, we'll be seeing, uh, we'll be definitely be seeing some, uh, some issues with lodging and, uh, and also uh, when you get uh, Get looking at the fields, there'll be uh, lots of issues with starting in them. So uh, this field was sprayed as well. So uh, you know, uh, I think timing again for canola this year for trying to spray for startinia would have been really difficult because of the uneven uh, germination, uneven maturity, and uh, and then just you know our extended flowering season. Uh, the potential for the disease to uh, infect the plant is going to be. Uh, a lot greater, so uh, you know I think it's something we'll be watching for this year and seeing uh, maybe having to deal with. Another disease that uh, haven't been seeing a whole bunch of uh, uh, whole bunch of it with yet, but uh, was in a field yesterday that uh, we were definitely seeing uh, some of the soybeans that were uh, starting to uh, yellow off and rot off, and uh, you know attributed to the wet conditions, uh, just uh, the plants are dead and, and wilted and they're yellowing. We're seeing uh, the root systems, really poor development of root systems and uh, when you uh, pull the you know, plants out there's no nodules as well, at all and you know those are what the plants are, are looking like and, and you know it's uh, not isolated to just the low areas but uh, definitely when you go around the low areas you're definitely seeing issues with uh, with uh, with root rot and uh, you know basically uh, something that's uh, brought on by the wet conditions and uh, you know you get away uh, from the wet spots it's definitely harder to find them and uh, so you know again just an issue with uh, with the wet conditions been getting some calls from producers because just like any other wet area it seems to uh, extend out from the water a little bit so they're seeing some of these things happening but. That's what uh, we're seeing, and you know, even the stunting of the plants, and just never able to get going because uh, just too wet for too long. I guess uh, with that, I kind of jumped around a little bit uh, from crop to crop, but I wanted to talk about disease issues. I wanted to talk about some of the insect issues that are happening right now, and uh, and uh, then you know, just kind of cover as many things as I could. So. Uh, uh, Karma, is there any questions? I'm not seeing any questions right now, Lionel. Okay. Um, I guess uh, I'm just about done the webinar then for today. So uh, regarding CCA credits, uh, 
If uh, you're uh, viewing this on a recorded webinar, we just need you to write a short summary of some of the topics we talked about today. And then if you could uh, forward that to preferably, preferably Linda Rickman, and she will, uh, she will uh, get you uh, signed up for your credits. Uh, if you've got questions or if you've got uh, issues out in the field in your area that you want somebody to look at, uh, that's my contact information as well as Linda's. And then there's the uh, FBAs in the Southwest and South Parkland area. Uh, so if you've got questions, uh, you can uh, get a hold of those uh, those people as well. And uh, I guess with that, uh, if there's no uh, no questions, uh, then uh, then I guess uh, we'll uh, we'll end the webinar for today. No, I am not seeing any more questions or any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Carmen.